Good morning, and thank you all for being here for the DA's regular Monday morning press conference. We do have a special topic today, uh, and that is business and residential corridor safety and the collaborations that are underway and will continue to be underway and next steps towards business and residential corridor safety. There's, there are three main points that we're trying to drive home today. And the first is that the DA's office remains committed to working with the Philadelphia Police Department, our state and federal law enforcement partners, to prioritize safety along business and residential corridors. In order to achieve the goal of public safety along these corridors, the DAO recognizes the necessity to increase its engagement and dialogue with retailers, small and minority-owned business owners, as well as community and faith leaders. It's something we've been doing for a long time, but it's something we need to keep doing and do even better. And finally, while the DAO remains very data-driven in developing its policies and is constantly in search of best practices towards public safety and criminal justice reform, we also recognize that none of our partners, including us, always gets it right, and therefore we remain committed to making the necessary clarifications, refinements, <coughs> tweaks, when necessary to increase transparency, trust, <coughs> collaboration. Simply put, we want it to work. Here's a little preview of what we will be announcing today. We will be announcing the launch of the DAO's organized retail theft and house theft task force. This is a task force recently funded mid-year by City Council and we're moving as quickly as we can to utilize those resources so that we can be effective as quickly as we can. We are also going to highlight the ongoing homicide non-fatal shooting units work with reference to crimes that are happening along business and residential Corridors. More specifically, we're going to talk about the conviction of Tyrone Leach, L-E-A-C-H. But let me start out, if I may, by recognizing the many supportive, wonderful collaborators who we have with us today. Uh, we have with us, first of all, Joel Dales, the Deputy Police Commissioner here from the Philadelphia Police Department. We have Phil Phyllis Jones Carter, retail owner of the A Part of Me Boutique. Thank you for being here. Benjamin Rowe, <clears throat> who is the owner of Red Caps Corners, and that, of course, is where we are right now. He has kindly hosted this event. Uh, he sells superheroes, but thank you for today. You're our superhero. We have Jackie Williams, business corridor manager for the Lancaster Avenue Business Association. Uh, Pete Wilson and Ishak Samai. These are co-founders of the Philadelphia Community outreach with whom we've been working for years on some very positive efforts. We have Imam Kenneth Nurdeen of the Philadelphia Masjid here. First Assistant DA Robert Listenby is present. ADA Kimberly Essex, <coughs> who is the Chief of the Economic Crimes Unit in the Philadelphia DA's office, and she is also <coughs> therefore supervising the DAO's Organized Retail Theft and House Theft Task Force. You may remember her from other press conferences where we were highlighting the incredible work she was doing with the Philadelphia Police and with others around house theft, which remains a very serious problem in this city. Akko McLean is here, paralegal and support staff for the Organized Retail and House Theft Task Force. ADA Joanne Pescatore is here, chief of the DAO's Homicide Non-Fatal Shooting Unit. We have ADA Bob Wainwright, Robert Wainwright, who actually prosecuted Tyrone Leach with reference to uh, the gun violence that occurred on and close to a business residential corridor in the near Northeast. Deborah Watson Stokes is here, senior advisor on personnel development and special projects, many of them involving gun violence from the DA's office. We also have Michelle Neal here, victim witness coordinator, Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, who will provide a report on some of the things that we have been doing for victims and witnesses in the past week. Uh, we have, at least in spirit, State Senator Vincent Hughes and Councilmember Curtis Jones, both of whom are extremely busy today with their day job, but it's my understanding that they were hoping to send representatives to be here today. All right, let's jump to the data around gun violence because it is interesting. Homicides year to date, 
27. On this date last year, there were 40. That is a decrease by one-third, decreased by 33%. But let's look a little bit more closely at that. I'm going to run through homicides over the last three years on this date. 27 this year, 40 last year, 46 the year before, 52 the year before. We are almost exactly at half as many homicides as during the middle of the pandemic. And we have seen over the past few years significant decreases. Year end decrease in homicides in 2022 was 8% down from 2021. Year-end decrease in homicides in 2023 was about 20% down. These are not only positive numbers, they were ahead of national averages for improvement. They were better than national averages for improvement for large cities. And here we are in 2024 at 27. But, you know, as always, we should be honest about it. It is also true that according to my information, this has been the coldest January, or at least there have been patches of cold in this January that we haven't seen since 2018. In 2018, at this time, there were 23 homicides. There are currently 27. So it is possible that the cold is, is a factor, a positive factor, but a factor in terms of these numbers. If we look at the week from January 24th to January 30th, which is how we count these things, there were five homicides in that week. Let's remember that at the height of the pandemic, it would have looked more like 10 and a half, because at that time we were averaging about 1.5 homicides a day. Right now, we're at 0 0.77. So almost three quarters of a homicide per day rather than one and a half. None of this, of course, is okay, but certainly it's, it signals significant improvement over where we were before. Uh, ordinarily, I like to get into more details when it comes to shootings and things of that sort for reasons I don't quite understand yet. Some of the data that we usually get is not available, um, but we look forward to being able to talk in more detail in the future around that. From January 24th to January 30th, there were 113 gun possession or gun violence incidents. Of those, 102 arrests were made by law enforcement and the DA's office opened 101 cases. There were 102 arrests, there were 101 cases open. Now normally at this point I would mention two or three shootings, I would summarize them for you, but we're going to do something slightly different today. Uh, rather than highlight those shootings, we're going to look very specifically at gun violence that is occurring in the vicinity of the corridors, and as it happens, we have a very recent <coughs> conviction for a shooting incident that will be explained by ADA Bob Wainwright. This is a first-degree murder conviction that was secured in the last couple weeks by ADA Robert Wainwright. It occurred on a business corridor on the 1500 block of Pratt, P-R-A-T-T -T Street, in the 15th Police District. The victim in this case was an 18-year-old young woman by the name of Alashe Reeder. Uh, and yes, we have spoken to her family. They do not have an issue with our using her name here. <clears throat> and needless to say, her name was also used publicly in court. For those of you who need to spell it, it's I understand it is A-L-L-A-S-H-A-Y. That's the first name, A-L-L-A-S-H-A-Y. Last name is Reeder, that's R-E-E-D-E-R, R-E-E-D-E-R. Uh, Mr. Wainwright has quite the record of wins, wins that are gained with integrity, wins that are gained by giving the other side everything they are entitled to under the Constitution, but he keeps winning because he, like so many of the assistant DAs in the DA's office now, is that prepared and that capable, and he does that good a job. ADA Wainwright. Thank you. Um, so as the DA uh, just said, this was a, a case that was tried earlier this month, it was January 9th. The defendant was a, a man named Tyrone Leach, and this occurred outside of a store at 1538 Pratt Street, Northeast Philly. Um, the victim, an 18-year-old young woman, Alice Shea Reeder, was actually not the intended target. So this was a case of transferred intent. Uh, the defendant, Tyrone Leach, um, was actually, uh, we see on video prior to the homicide, uh, engaging in 
uh, giving uh, Ms. Reeder a hug at one point. Uh, they're cl clearly on friendly terms. But then at some point, this happens in the morning around uh, just before 8 a.m., uh, another individual who was the intended target, a man uh, who the defendant uh, described as, as a man named Leek, he arrives on scene, and the moment that he arrives, we see the defendant, uh, Tyrone Leach, take a step back, look behind him, uh, look back at Leek, pull out a gun, hold it there for a moment, and then pull out, uh, fire and shoot. Unfortunately, and um, I mean, it wouldn't have been fortunate had he hit the intended target either, but he hits Ms. Reeder, who was standing next to Leek at the time. He hits her one time in the neck, and she immediately goes down to the ground. Uh, the intended target, uh, this guy Leek, he runs off. The defendant runs off in the other direction. We see Leek on camera um, pull out his own gun. He had a gun on him, too. That's the intended target. Um, but he pulls out that gun well after uh, Ms. Reeder's already been shot and the defendant's already run off. So it was a case that was tried in, in front of Judge Bronson uh, earlier, well, early January, and the defendant was found guilty of first-degree murder for the murder of Ms. Reeder. He was also found guilty of the attempted murder of the intended target, um, as well as gun charges. Uh, is that sufficient? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, obviously, if there are questions, we will address them at the end. Thank you, Bob. All right, at this point, I'm going to call forward Michelle Neal to provide an update regarding the work of the DAO's Victim Support Services Unit, which includes a report on our CARES Unit. The CARES Unit, of course, works intensively and early on with the families of hom homicide victims. Obviously, these cases affect and appear on business corridors. They also affect and appear in residential corridors, as we have just heard from Mr. Wainwright. Um, and Michelle Neal will provide an update to give us a little bit more specifics consistent with privacy concerns about the activity in the office to support and to protect victims and witnesses. Michelle. Thank you very much, D.A. Krasner. Good morning, everyone. My name is Michelle Tuller Neal, and I've worked um, in the Victim Witness Department of the Juvenile Unit for over 20 years. Over the years, I have provided the initial outreach to victims whose cases will be heard in the juvenile courtrooms. My initial outreach usually involves a telephone call, a text, and a letter. During this engagement, I explain victims' rights, the criminal justice system, its process, current procedures, notifications, and outcomes, as well as aid in the gathering of documentation for recovering financial losses and other crime-related expenses which are not covered by insurance. Throughout the years, I've worked with the various community-based agencies that will assist crime victims with support services, court accompaniment, crisis counseling, emergency needs, and assistance in filing victim compensation claims. These services are recommended and tailored based on the victim's need as they navigate the court, system, court process. This partnership and engage ensures that we provide the best social services to all victims, witnesses, and family. For example, in two of my outreaches last week, talking about the whole corridor, I spoke with a victim regarding from a educational institution regarding defendants accessing the building and smear the doors and floor in the hallway with paint and graffiti on the walls. Apart from discussing the services that I listed above, we discussed services that are available throughout the, system, the city to assist the removal of the graffiti, etc. In addition, we talked about prior comments, submitting a victim impact statement, and receiving restitution to cover out-of-pocket expenses. Another outreach call um, was from a well-known retail store our retail theft that not only include the theft of the merchandise, but also damages done to the property. My conversation is very similar to the previous outreach. The difference is that the victim is self-insured, and as such, he's looking for compensation not only for his merchandise, but for the damages done to the property. In both cases, I connected and collaborated with community agencies to provide additional social services. At the end, we care for victims' physical, emotional and financial needs after a crime. I will now provide you with a brief update on CARES. 
As you may already know, CARE stands for Crisis Assistance, Response, and Engagement for Survivors. And the objective of CARES is to provide comprehensive immediate advocacy and support services to survivors of homicide. That being the case, the CARES team provided to four families during the week of January 27th to February 2nd and provided 12 services to all families. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ms. Neal. All right. We are now delighted to announce the launch of the DAO's Organized Retail and House Theft Task Force. And in making this announcement, we want to focus on five key areas as we provide an overview of the work of this task force. First thing is the policy, the DAO policy around these types of offenses. Number two, the personnel leading the task force, you'll be hearing about that from Kim Essek, who is the chief of the Economic Crimes Unit and is also going to be supervising the DAO's Organized Retail and House Theft Task Force. Third, we'll be talking about the partnership with law enforcement. That will also be led by Kim Essek. And then we're going to talk, fourth, about the partnerships with community and retailers. I will lead that section and the people most impacted. Now that, number five, the people most impact, will be led by our guest retails, retailers and community stakeholders, several of whom will have some uh, relatively brief comments on that. We'll get to that in a minute. Let me start by talking about the policy. So uh, what is house theft? I'm sure a lot of you know. It's usually the victimization of a family who have lost a homeowner either to nursing care or lost them because they have passed on. What has been going on for many years in Philadelphia and what we have extended quite a bit of effort to try to get at, but frankly, we needed more resources for it, is the reality that in a city that is famous for a high level of home ownership, that's one of the best pieces of economic news about this city. If you go back a few decades, we were starting to see more and more destabilization of certain neighborhoods when a house would be stolen and then tenants who didn't know it was stolen would sign a lease with the thief and move in, placing police in a very, very difficult position to deal with phone calls from the neighbors saying, how come people are in Mrs. Jones's house? What made it even worse, of course, is that the homeowners, because it's a civil matter, are not entitled to a free attorney. Homeowners or the family of a homeowner are often financially strapped they don't have the money. It's hard for them to go hire a lawyer to try to untangle all of this. Uh, the damage that is done by house thieves is considerable. It is problematic. It is bad for the city in every way, and it attacks the generational wealth of the families that own those homes. So we are excited to continue that work, which has been done extremely well by uh, Kim Essek and by PPD and other partners. But frankly, we need more people. We need more money. We need to be able to have more people who can work on it full time. Because we know that a lot of these houses are making their way to legitimate, or maybe legitimate, wholesale dealers in real estate. And all of the related professions around that, things like title search uh, investigators, title search insurance companies, people who do closings, real estate lawyers, developers, people who do construction, they should not be involved in a process where people are being ripped off for their homes. Second, of course, is we have a significant problem with retail theft in the city of Philadelphia. The statistics support that. It is a national phenomenon, but that doesn't make it okay. And we need to work together and collaborate to do everything we can to, uh, to get behind that. So, in terms of policy, the DAO's retail theft policy is going to be updated. Uh, it will be refined, and it will be released in the next 7 to 10 business days. I do want you to understand there's been a false narrative out there for some time, repeated and repeated and repeated by certain people, that the DA's office does not prosecute retail theft below a certain value. That is false. That has always been false. That has never been the case. What the policy actually said was that below a certain dollar value, we would prosecute these cases as 
summaries, which we have done, and a summary offense can put you in jail for up to 90 days. It's actually no joke. But having said that, there has been so much of a false narrative around this dollar amount uh, with, and this false repetition of the notion that we don't prosecute these cases that our new policy will take that distraction away by not referring to a particular dollar amount. We realize that the language uh, has been misrepresented and we don't want there to be any confusion about what the policy is. The new policy is going to focus on three main buckets. The first one is fencing operations. As we've discussed before, fencing, meaning the purchase or the receipt of stolen goods for resale, has in the last 10 years be become a much bigger problem, partly because of the existence of the Internet and the reality that you can have a warehouse full of stolen goods where they are sending all over the country millions of dollars worth of stolen goods and also supplying them as a uh, black market source of wholesale to corner groceries. This has to stop, so part of the bucket will be going very vigorously after fencing operations, often fencing operations that are led by people who are making a whole lot of money doing it. The second thing is we need to go after prolific offenders, people who do a retail theft and they, they just keep doing it and doing it and doing it, no matter how many times they are arrested and locked up. And third, we need to talk about what's really going on with the, the largest portion of people who are engaging in retail theft. Uh, and we need to talk about ways to make the public safe by fixing the underlying issues. We know that these underlying issues might look like homelessness, but in reality what you're looking at is usually addiction and the uh, motivation to steal in order to support a drug habit that many of them would love to be able to shake to get behind them. So. Uh, with reference to that group, the group of people who are not fundamentally professional criminals, the group of people who are caught in an addiction at a time when opioid manufacturers are, have half destroyed this country, when we're talking about them, we will be talking about treatment, restorative justice, diversion, and other ways to try to fix the underlying issues because, frankly, if you don't fish, fix them, they will be right back unless you can remove the motivation by providing treatment and other opportunities and figuring out what's behind this drug addiction the public will not be safe, they will be back. It is now my pleasure to introduce Kim Essek, who's going to talk first about the personnel leading the task force and then about the partnership with law enforcement. Kim? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be brief um, with regard to the speaking about this task force. I apologize for my appearance. I just had surgery, so I'm going to make this as sure as I can and not repeat all the information that the DA has given you. Um, house theft and uh, retail theft have become pretty hot topics in Philadelphia, and it's understandably as to why that would be. One of the two things that make a person feel secure in their community is having security in their home and security in where they want to go out into their communities to shop, and just to be able to go out and buy things for their daily lives. Bless you. Um, with regard to retailers as well. They need to be secure in their business, that they can open up their shops every day, and be secure that they're going to be able to sell products, and that their employees are safe, and that they're safe, and that the community is safe. Um, with regard to retail theft and house theft, there's been a lot of talk that we don't prosecute those crimes, but we have been prosecuting them up until today, simply because there is a task force now that will be housing those types of crimes. That doesn't mean we weren't doing this before now. What we have done now is work now in the community with the retailers as well as the police department who is doing a phenomenal job in collaboration with us to come up with a better approach about how we tackle both of these issues at the same time. To that end, City Council has funded a task force that I will be supervising. Um, I would have actually more DAs here with me today, but we already have three who are on who are on the task force right now who are currently in court prosecuting those very crimes for people who are of what we consider 
uh, prolifically self up defenders. Because while we're only speaking about this here today, we have quietly been doing the work, and those in the community, in the business community, as well as the police department can attest to that. I will let the police department tell you at a later time, and we'll probably come back and speak um, uh, at some later date about all the work that we've been doing since it's just been getting off the ground, but we have been working together um, in order to better and more efficiently fight these crimes both for house theft as well as retail theft. Um, so far we have three members of the district attorney's office who are on the task force. We just had two more accept the position. We have an external um, position posted, so we are still taking our, our resumes in in order to fully fund this task force. We have Akko here with me today. She has come to the unit to be basically my support and backbone in order to collect all the data that I'm sure people are going to want to hear about later on down the road so that we will be more adequate and able to come to these podiums and tell you about the work that we've been doing for both health theft as well as retail theft. And uh, we hope to have more detectives as well. We really want to focus as much as we can on the top tier of the fencers because unfortunately what we have found is they are utilizing people who have drug addiction in this city to their own benefit and using them in order to get them the product that they want to sell illegally, either in other stores, on the street. At times they even go door to door and knock on someone's door and ask for a list and then send their people out to collect product for them. So this is what we're looking to combat. We hope to be able to secure more detectives for this as well so that we can do a lot more of our own internal investigations. We already have been collaborating though on those fencing operations with the police department. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Kim Essig told you she had surgery. She didn't tell you why. It's because she's been punching out <laughs> professional house thieves and professional retail thieves. Thank you for your service. It's very appreciated. All right. Um, so I think it's very, very important to understand that the nature of the partnership that we see going on and that we hope will get better and better involves listening to community and business owners listening to their issues and trying to see how we can get around them. Just today, I won't say who, I won't embarrass the person, but just today I heard something from a retailer here as we were getting ready to do this press conference that was frankly jaw-dropping. There's a gap in the system that was revealed in that conversation, and that's why it is so important that we're in the same space, that we're talking to each other, that we're not siloed. And I, I say that with reference to all of our law enforcement partners, but even more importantly with community, to see what the experience is. It is, after all, our job to provide these services, to try to protect them in any, any way that we can. And if we do not hear from the people most affected, then we will not be able to solve it. Um, I, I would also like to point out that we have been in close contact by deploying members of our community engagement team, which is under the DAO's External Engagement and Government Affairs Division, led by G. Lamar Stewart. We have been communicating with shop owners and people who work on business corridors for a number of years, including uh, during the unrest after the murder of George Floyd by Derek Chauvin. Obviously, we needed to engage store owners who had suffered losses and gone through a lot in that period. That was extremely helpful to us. And that's something that we are hoping to continue to do and to do even more effectively. I'll have an announcement on that in a minute. But it is now my pleasure to introduce several people who will speak briefly, a couple minutes or so, to give you some insight into this partnership and our efforts as we work together and some of the things that have already been going on. And they will be uh, one, two, three, four, five, six people or groups of people who will be speaking. The first is Jackie Williams, who is the business corridor manager of the Lancaster Avenue Business Association, known as LA21. The second will be Phyllis Jones Carter, a retailer and owner of the A Part of Me boutique with the very, very fashionable red glasses. <laughs> As someone who really loves nice glasses, I want you to know I appreciate them. Um, and then we will have Benjamin Rowe, retail owner of Red Caps Corner, where we are right now. And speaking of superheroes, we will have Pete Wilson and Ishak Samai, co-founders of the Philadelphia Community Outreach after that. 
The last two speakers will be Deputy Commissioner Joel Dales from the Philadelphia Police Department, and thank you for being here, and uh, Resident Imam Kenneth Nuruddin from the Philadelphia Mosque. It is my pleasure at this time to call forward first Jackie Williams. If you forget where you are in order, don't worry. I'll get back up if there's any confusion. Jackie Williams and then Phyllis Jones Carter, Benjamin Rowe, Pete Wilson, and Ishak Samai. Joel Dales and Kenneth Nerdy, Deputy Commissioner Joel Dales and Imam Kenneth Nerdy. Right, thank you so much. Good morning. Still morning, right? Good morning. Uh, Jacqueline Williams with uh, LA21, and I have to put in, in support my three of my <laughs> cleaning ambassadors. LA21 has a uh, contract with the com with the Commerce Department to clean from 34th to 52nd. And these are some of our um, cleaning ambassadors. They help to keep the cor corridor clean. We know that a clean corridor is a more safe corridor. So I just want to, um, you know, Amir is here, Scott, and also Kira. And also we have a couple of our businesses. Mary Barnes is here. Thank you, Mary, for coming. Also, it's our representative from Antonio's, and thank you, Antonio's, for the hoagies. Uh, Antonio is a new business here on Lancaster Avenue, right across the street, and we love his hoagies, and everybody likes his hoagies, so I just had to say that. Uh, so thank you for coming and doing the um, giving us a donation of hoagies. Uh, we are... LA21 is continuing to work collaboratively with the DA's office, with the CLC, and of course with our small businesses. What we do is we support small businesses, home-based businesses, and businesses here on the corridor. We provide technical support and we help them with the issues that they will have. We know that small businesses have issues and we're here to help them. And with the CLC collaboration, that has also helped with security. We know that on Lancaster Avenue, there are hot spots, we call them hot spots, um, that have some activities. And so CLC has worked, we have worked collaboratively with CLC, with the PPD, and the DA's office to help um, those hot spots get a little bit warmer, in fact, cold, so that there's not as many different activities that are not, uh, that we don't want them want to be on the corridor. So thank you so much. Um, for being here, and uh, we appreciate all the uh, support and um, all of the activities that we are working with with the DA, CLC, and our other collaborative partners. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Phyllis Jones Carter, and I ha I own a part of. Me, Boutique, is right down the street at 3834 Lancaster, and the glasses did come from my store and everything else I have on. Um, I started my business by happenstance. Um, I just retired from the Department of Corrections, um, PA Department of Corrections as a program manager after 37 years with the Commonwealth. And I was just driving down the street a couple months later. There was some burnt out buildings down the street. I um, took a chance. And I opened up my store in November that year at 3834 uh, with clothing um, from $5 to $800 uh, on Lancaster Avenue. And I also have next door now, 38, 3836, where I repurpose furniture um, from $10 to maybe $1,000 and artwork, um, if you're interested in any of that. But I've been... Therefore, this is literally my 14th year. When I started, there was not one not store one. Not one. in that block. Not one. <laughs> not one. Yeah. And uh, one next time, there were probably like three or four and 14 years ago. Um, I haven't had any real problems with um, retail theft, only for my potteries. I plant flowers at almost $1,000 through the whole block, and people take the whole pots. But other than that, you know, that's it. And I work with the... Um, 16th district um, in terms of stealing my flowers or any other issues I might have. But thank you. Hello. Good morning. My name is Ben Rowe. I'm the owner of Red Caps Corner, where we're all standing. We're the, uh, the city's oldest and largest uh, tabletop gaming shop and event center. With, uh, we host 25 or more gaming events every single week. And uh, we are celebrating our 15th anniversary tomorrow as a business. 
Um, I, uh, I'm happy to host DA Krasner's office here. I'm looking forward to uh, working with them in the, in the future on this. I know that issues regarding retail theft can be fraught. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of delicacies involved with making sure that people are, um, are treated equitably and, and, uh, and justice is served um, accordingly. Uh, but I trust DA Krasner's office to uh, to handle this well, and I'm looking looking forward to working with them. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Pete Wilson. I'm co-founder of Philadelphia Community Outreach, which was established in 2013. I want to give a special shout out to uh, DA Krasner for being with us uh, <clears throat> most of that time, and also the 16th District. They've been traveling with us on this journey from the very beginning. And we've been able to reduce crime. I'm happy that you brought up the stats. I think that we're, our involvement and the work that we do help us reduce the homicides. We have cameras at 41st and, Pat, 41st and Lancaster, uh, Preston and Lancaster that covers that area. But on the retail theft, we know what that promotes. Laws. It promotes laws. And the commercial corridor with these businesses are struggling as it is. So I'm happy that the DA has formed a task force to attack these problems because what happens is, as you well know, the cost is pushed over to the consumer. Okay? They have to hire people to work in the store. They already have cameras. And then they have to hire folks to eyeball people when they come in. And that makes people feel uncomfortable that are not there to steal but to purchase items. So I'm very happy that, again, Krasner and this, uh, the police department has uh, collaborated to try to end this problem that we have. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm Ms. Oxamai, co-founder of the Philadelphia Community Outreach. Um, the couple of what Pete Wilson has said, we're here to actually do raise the awareness of the community insight that we have to have in order to deal with a lot of this lawlessness that we have in the community. It's, it's going to really take everybody's involvement, yeah. press, law enforcement, district attorney's office, elected officials. All that's important working together cohesively in order for us to make, make the necessary problem we have to have as a community of Philadelphians. And that's why we call ourselves the Philadelphia Community Outreach because the whole Philadelphia is affected by, even the, what the Lancaster Avenue situation, the whole of Philadelphia is affected. So we may not affect us personally, but overall it has to do with the atmosphere of the city. So we have to realize how we have to work collectively and create the necessary insight to allow us to address the issue and then we'll be able to, we feel as though we'll be able to satisfy the community. We have to remember, we're on Lancaster Avenue, Lancaster Avenue was a viable, Card, the commercial card, to the residents here for decades. Now we have a problem. We can read, we can work together collectively, and we can satisfy that problem and get this thing done. Small fest, petty theft, we know it's drug addicts, true, but that's something we cannot tolerate. We have to be able to address all these issues collectively, and we'll be, I'm sure, that we'll be able to answer the problem. Thank you again. Good morning. On behalf of Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel, I want to emphasize our strong support for our local businesses and residents. We are dedicated to ensuring the safety of both commercial and residential areas in our city. PPD will continue to collaborate with the District Attorney's Office, our local, state, and federal partners, as well as the community. That is why we're here today. We recognize that creating a comprehensive safety network requires teamwork. As part of Commission Police Commissioner Bethel's 100-day plan, PPD aims to enhance our footbeat initiative in the business and residential corridors. Visibility is crucial. By continually using a footbeat model with steady assignments, officers will actively connect with community members through initiatives such as parking walks, which is in addition to the assigned footbeats, and also business corridor safety checks. This strategy aligns, the, this strategy aligns uh, with Mayor Parker's safety plan and our belief that being present in our communities is essential for creating a sense of security 
and deterring criminal activities. So let's move forward together, committed to safeguarding our businesses and residents and ensuring the well-being of everyone in our city. Thank you. Good morning, I am Imam Kenneth Nardine from the Philadelphia Message, Clay Muhammad School, right up Lancaster Avenue. And you know, we have assembled here today all the components that make up a village. Uh, and not only does it take a village, but it makes a village. And we have to realize that if we don't have law enforcement, if we don't have restorative justice, if we don't have strong business corridors, if we don't have housing where people feel stabilized, then we really don't have the infrastructure that can give us a foundation to address issues as they come up. We have acute problems, but we have chronic conditions. And so as we leave here today, remember, we can all be a part of an orchestra that plays the same notes, that coordinate our efforts and our abilities. But I would like to just leave with two things that were mentioned. Jackie spoke about the hot shots the hot spots. Brad spoke about giving people dignity. The community component comes to the avenue to engage in a medium of exchange. If they feel dignity from those who are the business owners, if they're treated with just some basic human dignity, then they'll feel some connection and they'll feel that they have something that they can exchange. Because remember the old African saying, if the people in the village, especially the youth, don't feel any warmth coming from the institutions, then they'll burn it down just to feel warm. Mm -hmm. So we have to always keep in mind that we do have to have our concerns, we do have to have order, we have to have justice, we have to have law enforcement, but we know we have a generation, and sometimes 13, 14, 15 year olds who are involved in homicide and crimes that make people feel unsafe. We know that there's still some potential to restore them. And so we always have to keep human dignity as part of our medium of exchange. We don't want the store owners just giving people products but also give them kindness and human dignity to the extent of your ability. So again, it makes a village what we're doing here today. So let us make certain that the inhabitants of the village feel that they are part of it. Thank you. Thank you to you, Imam, to the Deputy Commissioner and all the other speakers for their insight. It's very much appreciated. I have a brief announcement before we go to uh, Q&A. And that is that, as we may have mentioned earlier, we're going to be starting a series of community town halls, community meetings. Some of them will be more private. Some of them will be more public. I'm sure you can figure out why. There is a reason in football for a huddle. You don't necessarily want the people who are professional house thieves and professional retail thieves to know you're coming or to know how you're coming. Uh, the first of these meetings will be Monday, February 26, 2024, and it will be on the topic of introducing the business community to the DAO's Organized Retail and House Theft Task Force. So they know the names, they know the faces, they have the phone numbers, they have the emails. They understand how to reach each other even if it happens to be on a Saturday or even if it has to, happens to be at 3 o'clock in the morning. And that is very important. That will be a more private meeting. But there will be a series of these meetings, and as I mentioned earlier, some of them will be more public. Because when we actually sit in the same room and communicate, knock down the silos across the board, we are more equipped to be effective in addressing these issues. Details on upcoming DAO community town halls, including topics, locations, thank you, and times will be announced in the days and weeks to come. All right. And with that, <clears throat> We are going to uh, Q&A. Uh, I will call on everyone. If I miss you, please make a point to hold up your hand and let me know that I've done that, but I'm going to try to get to everyone. Everybody who has signed on to the sheet, I will uh, call upon first. Ray Strickland, 3CBS. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, one question uh, asked about data. Is there any numbers that you can provide 
two questions. Is there any numbers that you can provide on retail theft and uh, how it's increased over the years or decreased over the years for that matter? Another question is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe there was a, a state law that was recently passed that increased the penalties on uh, retail thefts like as far as a certain value number and a, a felony that's associated with it. Can you talk about that law and how that could potentially help deter uh, these types of crimes? Uh, so let me go to your, the first part of your question first. In terms of data, the I would say that the most basic, simplest piece of data to look to would be the year-end reports for last year having to do with different crimes. What, will you, what you will see when you look at that is generally good news, but not in terms of retail theft. More specifically, if you look at the PPD's publicly available database, and it still contains the weekly reports, which if you look at the final week, week 52, I think they called it week 53 because it overlapped the beginning and end of the year. What you'll see there is um, what happened to different types of crime. Retail theft is a separate category on that list, and it was up very substantially last year. The number at the end of the year, I don't remember offhand, it was probably up something like 75% something or 50%, something along those lines. But it is available. Uh, in, in terms of a lot of the other areas, we saw spikes in car theft, and in retail theft, almost every other category of property crime was down or flat. And we saw within the violent crimes listed, all but one were down at the, the end of the year. And if I recall correctly, the one that was up was up about 1%. So while there was a lot of good news, it was not good news. In terms of car theft, it was not good news in terms of retail theft. If there is more data that you want, we can try to go back and get you some more data on that because we are very interested in that data as you are. Your second question was about whether a state law has passed recently that would change uh, some things. Um, I am aware of there having been a proposed law, but let me check with uh, ADA Essek in case she knows what its status is at this point. 